Welcome to Encounter Grace, where we come face to face with God's work in the world for our good. Join host Jason McKnight as we explore practical issues of community, theology, and leadership in everyday life. Hey everyone, and welcome to Encounter Grace. My name is Ben Hendricks, and I have with me Jason McKnight. And today, what we're going to do is take a look at Jordan Peterson's famous book, 12 Rules for Life. So, first of all, what is this book? Really, the title is 12 Rules for Life, An Antidote for Chaos. So that's not just chaos in general, but specifically chaos in your life, how you can order your days and outlook for maximal flourishing. So in other words, in short, this book is about maturity. So what specifically we're going to do today is kind of go back and forth, set the table for the book, and then explore a few of the rules together. So first of all, why, why even do this? Why yeah, look at this great. book? Because Jordan Peterson isn't specifically a Christian, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So though he's not a believer, he's interestingly enough, very sympathetic to the need for scripture as the basis of Western story and reason and thought. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's, it's all over and all throughout the book as he's constantly quoting scripture. Uh, large passages and portions on, in the book are literally just him quoting that constantly bringing back to the story of Je- uh, stories of Jesus and just how Jesus worked in that life and how that in- ultimately influences Western thought, story, and on. So while he's not a Christian, he's got many good things to say mm-hmm. that I think will help us. And if you read them, help you. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so what else? Yeah, I think that's great. So the first reason is he's going to help us. And, and, you know, you read the book. I read the book uh, last year, the year before, whenever I think it's three yeah. years old. And five million other people read the book at least, and it it has helped a lot of people. That's the first reason. We think you'll be helped by it. Second reason is because over these last five, six, seven years, Jordan Peterson has become a cultural phenomenon for different reasons, and hmm. it would be fun to explore together on this podcast a little bit. He is a very clear thinker, and as Ben says, he's not a believer so far as we know, but here's what's very interesting. He's poking holes all over the place in the uber political correctness Mm. that has put everyone in the West in a straitjacket right now. Nobody can say anything without getting canceled and Twitter mobbed and all this kind of stuff. But he's willing to, you know, stand aside and say, hang on, this isn't making any sense. Mm. And, um, and, and it's, it's fascinating. He's so a couple of more pieces by way of why he's a cultural phenomenon. He's uh, a clinical psychologist and an academician in psychology at the University of Toronto. Previously, he taught at Harvard. Uh, So here we go. Wait, somebody from within psychology is saying no to political correctness? What's going on? So fascinating. Um, (laughs) He's hated by people on the progressive left. Which is an understatement. (laughs) An understatement. Uh, They are... Um, they just drag him through the mud. I don't know if you read the Sunday Times in yeah. London. <laughs> I don't. But we saw the hit piece they did on him at the beginning of April where they, I mean, anyway, it, it's just fascinating. They, they, they're taking him apart. They will call him far right. They'll call him fascist, but only because they want to tar him with a brush so that people would stop listening to him. But the fact of the matter is I've listened to him. He's actually politically center left. Yeah, he, He's kind of in the middle of the road, but he leans left, and he calls out fascists all the time. So he's, he's not that. So they must be scared. They, meaning, you know, the progressive left. But here's the reason they're scared. He's one of the most viewed channels on YouTube, mm. especially if you peel out all the fail army stuff <laughs> and you just go to where content is being delivered. The content that he delivers is some of the most viewed stuff by a long shot. So why is this? Now, I'm going to tell, say, as we answer why, and then go to the book, I want to say one more thing, which I find interesting. Um, 12 Rules, a bestseller, 5 million copies. No big deal. People write bestsellers all the time. It's 450 pages of 12 Rules, and so it's fascinating. Here's the twist. He did a book tour as this came out. Now, this is all pre-COVID, 2018, I think. He did a book tour 
not of little Barnes and Noble in Greenville, North Carolina, and hoping to sell 29 <laughs> books. You know, he did a 100 city book tour, booking large auditoriums for two hour lectures, and Penguin Publishers published the book. They say over 250,000 people attended in person. Wow. Well, 100 cities, 250,000, it's 2,500 people per lecture, per engagement as an average. We're supposedly living in the dumbing down of the Western world. It's very interesting to me that this amazing cerebral thinker standing astride the cultural narrative right now is garnering a quarter of a million people. Like, it's not you too. Yeah. Or, or R Rolling Stones or, you know, whoever. I mean, he's selling out crowds to listen to a lecture. What's going on? Where did that come from? Well, you know, for years, as we've said, he's been uploading lectures to the University of, or from the University of Toronto to YouTube. And those lectures are just getting uh, uh, view upon view upon view. People are longing for someone to help them think well. And so the other thing is he's not just a teacher, a professor. He's a clinical psychologist. I think we said that. Hmm. Thousands of hours over 30 years of clinical interactions with people, watching them grow, helping them out of where they are, bringing to bear the best of psychological thinking and counseling to where people are. So this is fascinating. Yeah, I think one of the encouraging things is he's, and these two things I think rarely happen, and specifically on YouTube, is when someone has a strong voice and they actually have the credentials to back it up. Right. Like, th yeah, he's not just a nobody in this. He does have the history. He's got, and he, mm. he's got the the effort and the, like that energy, and he got all of it to him. And people are coming to see him. I mean, like specifically on one of the most, if not the most, uh, watched, uh, I guess, podcast next to ours uh, is Joe <laughs> Rogan's. Uh, and several of his like biggest hits yeah. were all uh, Jordan Peterson of his and he's had him on there I think twice mm -hmm. so people are listening and yeah. what a good thing and it's interesting like the um, in in Britain the Kathy Newman interview which you can li you can google on YouTube uh, Kathy Newman Jordan Peterson the mm -hmm. interview is about 30 minutes it'll come up it's probably the most watched interview in the history of the world wow but it's fascinating because here's this reporter, and she's a good reporter. She's, you know, uh, I don't know if it's Sky TV or whatever it is in, in England, um, but she's she's a good reporter. He ate her lunch. I mean, he just, he Gosh. just, and, and not meanly, but he's just unflappable. Yeah. And he's just careful. And he has, like, the mind with the data from psychology. And, I mean, it's just interesting to hmm. watch someone able to say, hang on, progressives, there may be another way to look at the world. So yeah. anyway, that's all Jordan so, Peterson. Let's talk about the book. Yeah. Why did he write the book? Well, we've got this highly knowledgeable guy <laughs> with a highly influential guy. What in the world did he write about? And, why, and again, yeah. why are we looking at this? So his kind of primary view of this is to see the world uh, not like, like so many have before, which is this seeing the world in, as a place of objects, or we often see it as a material place. Like, uh, Humans, yeah. Yeah, that... It's just simply the things that are in it. But mm -hmm. he kind of takes a more dramatic approach by seeing the world as a drama with a couple mm. key movements or forces. Which kind of approaches Christianity. the way. It does. Anyway, sorry, yeah. I'm presupposing. Yeah, yeah. uh, but just to kind of run through it pretty quickly, he sees them in two major movements or forces, order and chaos. Hmm. So order and chaos. And so order is where the people around you act accordingly to well-understood social norms and remain predictable and cooperative. This is literally his quote. Yeah. It's the world of social structure, explored territory, and familiarity. In other words, order is kind of this creation. It's this place of goodness mm. and well-being. Like That's the where growth is coming from. But then there's, on the opposite side, chaos. And chaos is where is where or when something unexpected happens. I mean, that's kind of like a literal definition. Yeah. And so yeah. in that dramatic way, chaos is the death. It's the dark side, if we want to go Star Wars here or whatever, right? <laughs> so what's Peterson's aim for the book? Well, he kind of wants to answer this question of how do we live with the most order amongst all the chaos? Huh. How do we live with the most order amongst all the chaos that's in the world? And so... If Naturally, he gives us 12 ways to do that. Right. So why don't we kind of go back and forth and walk through some of, I don't, maybe the, the, the two or four or so 
ones that most yeah. stood out to us or yeah. we found most influential? And why don't you go first? And, and frankly, how we picked... <laughs> We, yeah. we both read the same copy of the book. I think it's your copy, and then yeah. you lent it to me. And uh, how we picked which ones to do for this podcast were really who underlined the most in each yeah. of these chapters. So this was interesting that uh, this is how we... Between the two of us, we had almost whole chapters underlined. It was great. <laughs> so I, I'll, just, I'll just, for fun here, um, again, rules over passions... Hmm order over chaos. And, and uh, Peterson kind of saying, hey, here's, here's 12 rules that'll help you overcome the chaos that's all around you. So here's rule number seven. We're not going to say all 12 rules. You can buy the book. But rule number seven is this. Pursue what is meaningful as opposed to what is expedient. Hmm. So expedient meaning what, right now what'll give me the most right now. Um, and, and here's his setup which again, he's not a believer, but he's very sympathetic to the story of Scripture. So not everything he writes and says is kosher, if you can use yeah. that word, uh, from a scriptural point of view. But that's okay, because, you know, chew the meat, spit out the bones kind of yeah. thing. Here's his setup. All of us suffer in life, and there's no escaping it. And all religions and all worldviews make a case to explain suffering. And most religions, most worldviews say it's inherent in reality. And that's ultimately a pessimistic outlook. If everything's in the universe can't ex escape suffering, what's the point of anything? If it's inherent mm. in all that is, why are we here? So let's eat and drink for tomorrow we die, which I think Paul quotes yeah. that Greek uh, quip. <laughs> if you can't ever escape suffering, let's just eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die. Mm. In other words, let's make decisions now for our pleasure because if all of life is suffering, then any fleeting pleasure needs to be captured and embraced right now because, in other words, eat dessert first. Hey, man, I can give on that. <laughs> okay, so we know that not all of life is suffering. We know the creation story. God created the whole world good. And so suffering is not inherent in the world, but then the whole world fell. And so suffering is universal in our yeah. experience and God is redeeming it through Christ. Okay, we know all that, but isn't that interesting suffering? So if it is universal and it is, and it is inescapable and at this moment it is, but Christ is redeeming it, we at least as Christians, and here's this thinking guy addressing deeper metaphysics. He's saying, look, maybe eat, drink, and be merry is not the best way to live life, to, to bring order out of mm. chaos. How about if we take a different tack? And he says this, here's the deal. Something better might be attained in the future by giving up something of value in the present. In mm. other words, delayed gratification. Yeah. Sacrifice now for something better later mm. in future orientation. So a meaningful life or a life of order, a life uh, without being driven by passion to do whatever. Hey, give up something now that's, that, uh, that might gain you something later. Delay the gratification. Embrace this concept of sacrifice for a greater reward in the future. Now, you can see kind of a biblical worldview coming out of this all yeah. over the place. Like Jesus, for the joy set before him, endured the cross... Uh, scorning the shame, but what was the joy set before him? He saw us redeemed mm -hmm. and being able to worship around the throne because he Man. died for us. And so he, he gave up and sacrificed something now in order for a greater gain future. So that's interesting. I, I think that that is a helpful thing because that's not what our culture is telling us. Our culture yeah. is totally telling us, eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die. Just if it feels good, do it. Just do it right now. But he's saying, look, a life that's worth living Pursue what is meaningful, not what's mm. expedient. That's kind of rule number seven gridded through me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what's what's one of the rules that you loved? I I think the one that might have been the most influential for me, and the second one was up there as well, but this one's rule number four. It says compare yourself to who you were yesterday, not to who not to who someone else is today. Hmm. And so what I love about this one is you can kind of read it and, and get at least face value what he's saying. But I think of it as in two steps. And the very first one is stop comparing yourself to others. Many, I, my, my fear is that many of us are racing strangers in their own races. 
Huh. That we we kind of perceive that that person and their success as the success. Like whatever that person's good at, that must be the greatest level of success, and I have to go beat them in that. I do that all the time. Why? Well, yeah, I mean, as as pastors and, and preachers, we're we're doing that all the time. Like whoever and it treads I, me down. Amen. And I think we we end up getting limited by the because of other people's success and the, and their race and their goal because mm-hmm. we try to go into it without ever ultimately preparing for that race. And so we have to adjust, and so the idea is, and, and so we have to adjust our lives and fix ourselves on obtaining whatever it is that they're setting up. And so whatever our desires are, they can't ultimately matter because whatever they're doing, that must be what success is. You may absolutely right. hate it. Right. It may be the things that you're not good at, that you're not gifted in, that you couldn't give a rip about. But because they may, maybe they have more followers, they have more likes, they're more influential. That must be what success is. And so you have to go race their race. Mm-hmm. So the big danger is that other people with their giftings, desires, and lives become the metric for success and flourishing for our lives. So the problem with that is we begin to believe some lies, I think. And so that, and some of the lies are this, that there's, the first one is that there's, and this comes right from Peterson, that there's only one, quote, game at which to succeed or fail. So huh. all that matters is this, yeah. that he that he or she is beating me in this, and that's all that matters. And that's a lie. And then secondly, this, the second lie that we, that we often believe is that I'm only playing one game, mm-hmm. as if all we are is that one thing. All I am is this. So I better be good at this one thing because that's all that matters. So for me growing up, it was sports, right? Specifically baseball or whatever sport I was playing. But if that person was better than me, they must have been better than me as a human being hmm. because they were better at me than this one thing. Right. And that was all that I was. I'm only this, this specific athlete. I'm only this person at school. And so what we do is be, we believe these lies that that's all that matter mm-hmm. and that's all that we are. Mm-hmm. And then we believe a third lie that it's winning is more important than growing. It's not. Here's the reality. Hmm. If we're always winning, we're most likely not growing. And if we're never growing, are we really ever winning? Because most of us are, here's the truth, is most of us are not competing in the upper echelon of sports. So like if you're, <laughs> if you're in the Olympics or you're in pro sports, this isn't for you, but for the rest of us, yeah. there's no gold medals, there's no Stanley Cups, mm-hmm. cash prizes, or Lombardi trophies. The true trophy for us is growth and refinement. So step two. Is to st- so stop, step one, stop comparing yourself to others. Step two, compare yourself to you hmm. yesterday. Mm-hmm. That if, if we're removing the metric, metric of success from other people, we need to put it on who we are because we're not competing against them. We're ultimately competing against who we were yesterday. And that's a much more helpful metric, I think. And so to do this, we must first at least have a preliminary understanding of who we are. What do I like? What do I want? What am I good at? Hmm. So... When we start putting that pressure on who we were yesterday, we start can, having a better understanding of, of are we actually growing and what does it mean yeah. to be getting better? Because yeah. we're not trying to beat ourselves from yesterday for a gold medal. We're just trying to grow and take a step forward. Yeah. So how does this help? Well, first, I think it adjusts our goals from winning from, from winning to, to growth and betterment. It's mm-hmm. a better perspective that I think we desperately need. Because so many of us are all or nothing. If I can't win this, if I can't beat you, it's yeah. not worth doing. Yeah. What? And so we just get stuck and we never get into things. Uh-huh. And then secondly, I think it's, we kind of, we, we get this goal and this understanding of, of being whole people and not just being gold medalists and winners. Mm-hmm. But to be better and to be whole, we have to start pro- being progressively better at things. That whether it's, your academics, whether it's the thing that you're doing for your job, whether it's parenting, whether it's marriage, whatever. There, it's unrealistic to think that you can be at a 10 when you're really starting at a two and you just need to take a step to be a three. That's right. So we need to stop comparing ourselves to so many other people because we don't know their story. We don't know their lives. And the truth is social media, the primary way we compare ourselves isn't always the most truthful thing. Yeah. And, and, People only put the highlight reel of their lives on social media. Amen. <laughs> they never put the big fight they just, well, maybe some people do, but then they're just trying to get yeah. a little sympathy. Anyway, that's good. Compare yourself to who you were yesterday, not to who someone else is today. I remember running uh, my first 
So I don't run marathons way too long for me, but half marathons are fun because just a couple hours and you're done. Yeah. And um, first half marathon, of course, you know, just finish the dang thing because you've never done it before. Yeah. Second half marathon, I wasn't going to win, but I sure wanted to beat my, my time from mm. the first one. And that was the goal. Like, yeah. how do I beat my time? How do I bet? Like, I knew I wasn't going to beat, you know, that, that little pipsqueak in the front row who's so thin and lithe and, you know, he was four minute miles or whatever. Yeah, right. <laughs> 13. But if I could just beat the time I ran the first one in, that was my goal hmm. uh, by X amount of time. Okay, rule number nine. So the third one we're going to look at of the four. Uh, rule number, his ninth rule is this. Assume that the person you're listening to might know something you don't. Back to social media. Yeah, right. I <laughs> know. Anyway, you know, genuine conversation, which is very hard to have on social media. You do find some people who can, who can converse on a thread well, but mostly it's hard on social media. But in life, it's getting harder mm. because people don't want to listen as much. Um, assume that the person you're listening to might know something you don't. That doesn't mean you have to agree with everything they say. But if I can learn one thing about them or their experience or how they view the world or one aspect of truth that I haven't thought of, that might help me. But I've got to have an open posture. So he, he suggested this. If you listen without premature judgment, people will generally tell you everything they're thinking. Now, James says mm. that, that the tongue nobody can tame. So if you stop talking and listen, people will tell you things. They'll invite you into their lives. People will generally tell you everything they're thinking with it, very little deceit. People will tell you the most amazing, absurd, interesting things. Very few of your conversations will be boring. <laughs> I think that's true. Yeah. If you're uh, respectful, empathetic, curious, you are going to have fantastic conversations. I think it's hard because... Two reasons, and they're a little bit different. One is we're always evaluating what's being said. And number two is we're always positioning ourselves. Mm -hmm. On the one hand, we're evaluating what's being said. So in a debate or a discussion, that's what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to evaluate and then chop it down or make it better or whatever. That's in a debate or a discussion. Not every conversation is a debate or a discussion. Sometimes you're relating. Sometimes you're hearing someone report something. But if I have my evaluate at all costs hat on, I'm only thinking critically about what they're saying instead of thinking empathetically. Hmm. What, what are they sharing with me? How are they letting me know their heart or their character or their fears or their dreams a little more? Now, it doesn't mean that I have to agree with everything they say, but sometimes I don't have to debate. I can practice hospitality. Yeah. And that's not always easy, and it's not always proper, but a lot of times it is. And maybe assuming that you can learn someone from something, uh, something from someone, that might help. Now, the other thing we do is we position ourselves. Yep. So we evaluate people say, but we also position ourselves. Maybe you do this in a conversation. Instead of listening to what's being said, especially if it's a vivid exchange of views, instead of actually listening to what's being said, you use the time the other person's talking to conjure up what you're going to say. <laughs> yeah, we were talking earlier and I, and I said that I had to specifically say I wasn't doing this. <laughs> so there's two monologues going on, yeah. uh, dancing around a similar subject, but it's really two monologues because as soon as you start opening your mouth, I'm thinking about what my next point will be that'll land really well. Or this, positioning ourselves, uh, or this. Sometimes this happens, you know, uh, someone will say, you know, I was, you know, when I was in Phoenix, I discovered the realities of illegal immigration firsthand. Uh, and so what they want to talk about is illegal immigration. But what happens is when they say, when I was in Phoenix, I discovered, I think, hey, I was in Phoenix once. And so I go down that road because the word triggers me to something that I just want to share. And then I, I miss out on what they wanted to see or talk about or engage me on, which is okay. And they, if they want, they can bring it back to that. Oh, that's nice that you drove four hours of Grand Canyon. Hey, let me share what I learned on the illegal, or you might have missed the opportunity. It's okay. But the idea even of knowing that sometimes I'm not even listening because I'm thinking about what I'm going to say is pretty helpful yeah. because if we're going to live a life that isn't filled with chaos, in other words, that grows to maturity, then sometimes learning from the other person Sometimes, very many times, learning from the other person, assuming they might have one thing to impart to me, that's going to get us a lot farther. 
It's such a great thing. That's a great thing. Especially in so, like an age of abundant knowledge where we can all feel like experts. Yeah. Like because it's so cheap, you can just Google it and find out. It's like, well, what do I need you for? Right. But I found one. Yeah. And it was funny. I think the Lord kind of pushed me down this route uh, around the time I got saved. I mean, about 10 mm-hmm. years ago. It was like I stopped looking at people as uh, as just like ways, yeah, ways to position myself and way, ways to make me feel good or better about yeah. who I am and how much I know. And be like, wow, like, like, I, what could I take away? And what could I learn? And what, how could I grow from who, like, what the Lord or whoever, like, how, like, what you know and what, yep. and all you've experienced. Yeah. Yeah. Well, give us the last one we're going to do today. Yeah. And I'll try to make, make it through pretty quickly. Uh, but this one's a funny one that we, it takes some explaining. So this is rule number 12, the one he ends with. Uh, and it's pet a cat when you encounter one on the street. Uh, something as, a guy who's taken several mission trips to the DR, I, I can't always recommend. Yeah, right. uh, but <laughs> the so his starting point, uh, and you've, you you taught you touched on this pretty briefly before, but he kind of has a pessimistic starting point for so much of the world, and that's where he starts in this chapter that the world we live in is filled with hurt, suffering, mm-hmm. and difficulty. Mm-hmm. Look, experientially, true. it's true, right? Yeah. Like yeah, we true. we ultimately know it's not the way it was designed, but we know. For many of us, that's true. And so we, as we get older, we see this more and more. Family pets get hurt. Family members pass away. We get cut from the team. We get broken up with. We don't get in the college we want. We get fired from the job. Mm-hmm. We're all, we're, so many of us at different times are experiencing hurt, suffering, and difficulty. So what happens then? Well, when those moments hit, we kind of witness two major human characteristics. And the first one's that we're limited, that mm. we can only do so much in these situations. Yeah. If COVID has taught us anything, yep. it's that we're limited people. And then secondly, if COVID taught us anything else, <laughs> that we're vulnerable, mm. that we are hurting. And it didn't take a ton for us to make make us feel so lost. Yeah. Like when the, when the family pet get, does pass away or whenever, or any of those examples, it's interesting how vulnerable and how limited we can feel in just a moment. And so when we feel this, we really have two choices that we can focus on our limits or we can focus on what we can do. Mm. So kind of the pessimistic, we focus on the limits, focus where we vilify our limits and we look at all those things that we can no longer do that maybe you were in a car wreck, maybe you got sick, maybe a spouse got sick, one of those bad circumstances happens and now it's limited you. Right. And what we often do is we look at all the things that we've lost. Well, I can't, I can't go do this anymore. I've lost my job, so I can't do this. And now I have to go sell the whatever or whatever circumstance it is. How is it, how is it limiting who you are or limiting your life? And we focus on that. Mm -hmm. But the other route that we can go is focusing on what we can actually do even though we have that circumstance going on, even though we have that difficulty, even though we have that burden. And the truth is, this is a very fundamental shift in perspective. Mm -hmm. It's to look at the world for what you can do and not all that you can't. Like I had to hear this. When I was reading this, it's just something that I always struggle with. I wanna focus on all that I've lost. Man, this one thing changed all of this. It ruined all of this. But the helpful reminder is to have that shift of perspective of, but man, I can still do all of these things, all of these really great things to be intentionally optimistic. And so big picture, it's we end up enjoying life deeper for all we can do despite all we can't. Be- and that's kind of that's the good. heart of what he's saying that uh, that 12th rule, pet a cat when you encounter one on the street. It's that amongst all of life, we're going to face difficulty, suffering, difficulty, hardship. Those are norms. But so are those little, often insignificant feeling joys that walk by and brush against our leg. Right. So the question is, are we willing to stop in the moment, even though we're on a trajectory to go towards our suffering, to focus on our difficulty? Are we willing to take a moment, stop and pet the joy? Hmm. Are we willing to sit there and be with the cat? That's a great question. And one that I think we do have to wrestle with. And Can we enjoy those moments? Yeah. yeah. And gifts of God's grace. Absolutely. Yeah. And they're so abundant. Yeah. Yep. And what's funny is I, 
I don't think I actually believed that until I like really was going through major difficulty and suffering. Mm-hmm. And once the Lord just mm-hmm. pointed back to all the things, like, yes, that, that was gone. Mm-hmm. And you no longer could have those moments or do this. But man, you get to double down on these mm-hmm. things. And how is the Lord going to show up in those ways? Yeah. Such an encouraging thing. That's great. Pet a cat when you encounter one on the street. 12 rules. It, they're fun. Listen, I would encourage uh, y'all uh, to get the book, to read the book or parts of it. Um, pick the rules you like. <laughs> get a half a bit of order. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit of chaos less. Uh, watch a little bit of uh, Jordan Peterson online. I mean, really, it's he's interesting. He's fascinating. Again, you're not going to agree with everything. I'm not agreeing with everything. But yeah. he's worth um, he's worth a little bit of us hearing and, and thinking through. So thanks for joining us today. Ben, thanks for leading us in this. And uh, we'll see you all here on the next time. Like it and subscribe and share. Help someone else who's a thinking Christian in everyday life. This is a ministry of Grace Fellowship Church in Kinston, North Carolina. Visit gracekinston.org or follow us on Facebook and Instagram.